function of the hypothalamus and thalamus. So we're going to be adding the mating factor to our image here. And so this is the set, uh, the, the component. These are the hormones made by the posterior, oxytocin and ABH. Okay, what I wrote on the board over there just prior to erasing it. So here would be the superoptic and paraventricular nuclei sending their ox, um, axons down to posterior pituitary. Are these part of the thalamus? Yes, they're online. And then over here is the anterior pituitary. And notice it is associated with the hypothalamus. That's what we're going to look at next, is what that association is. Down here are the hormones, prolactin growth hormone, FSH, HPV, that I wrote earlier. How is that regulated by the hypothalamus? So those are hormones made by anterior pituitary, and we're going to look at the regulatory effect of the hypothalamus. <coughs> releasing hormones are coming from the hypothalamus. This chart right here is referring to some of the releasing hormones coming from the hypothalamus, the ones that we're going to look at. There's a few others. And this is what the anterior pituitary is making. Okay? So, looking at our image right now, does the posterior pituitary, is the posterior pituitary affected by releasing hormones from the hypothalamus? No. The hypothalamus is actually synthesizing those hormones, so it regulates itself. All right? If it wants to make less, it makes less up here and is regulated on whether those are released or not at this point. So when we talk about releasing hormones or releasing factors, the terms are interchangeable from the hypothalamus, that's going to the anterior pituitary. So we have another nucleus that we're gonna talk about. Hormones in the hypothalamus, and these are known as forming the ventral medial nucleus. And they make releasing hormones, which means they get in the bloodstream, sometimes referred to as releasing factors. These neurons don't travel very far. They travel to this lower area of the hypothalamus, known as the median eminence. So it's like the kind of the transitional area between hypothalamus and the stock. All right, now we set the scene. Having put this list up here, I'm going to refer to it um, after I'm done with the pathway. I'm going to go back to this image that you have in your lecture notes. So we're looking at the portal hypophyseal system. Here comes the blood vessels to the hypothalamus. And remember, it's going to be carrying various amounts of hormones from the other organs in the body. So estrogen and progesterone and thyroid hormone and cortisol from the adrenal gland. So that vessel coming in is the superior hypophyseal, that's just our fancy word for pituitary, superior hypophyseal artery. goes to the posterior pituitary gland. Okay. So in our portal system, we have an artery. It breaks down into arterioles. And then our first capillary bed, right? So this is going to break down into arterioles and, cap and uh, capillaries. That's going to be our illustration for our capillary.
thyroid are leaving the cat bed one and diffusing into this area of the hypothalamus, binding to receptors, and to use an anthropomorphic term, telling the hypothalamus what the level of those hormones are. Right? So there's lots of estrogen, it will bind to lots of receptors up here. At the same time that it's giving off those hormones, it's picking up the releasing hormones from the hypothalamus. So gonadotropic releasing hormone, the molecules that I showed you here. Gonadotropic releasing hormone, cortisol releasing hormone, and thyroid releasing hormone are going to be, as well as dopamine, uh, which we'll talk about on Thursday, are going to be entering into that area, into the cat bed one. Where is it gonna go? Where are those releasing hormones going to go? If it's a portal system, after the first capillary bed, we have veins. Exactly. So we're going to have portal veins carrying it from cat bed one. So two things will happen there. Two things happen in cat bed one. Well, more than two, but we're focusing on two. The hormones from the body exited the capillary bed and went into the hypothalamus. And the releasing factors or hormones from the hypothalamus went into cat bed one. And then they are carried down the portal veins to cat bed two. And there, those releasing hormones will leave cat bed two and go into the anterior pituitary. And the hormones that anterior pituitary makes will go back in, will go into the capillary bed two to be carried to the rest of the body. All right, so let me say that again. Cat bed one is gonna give up systemic hormones that came from the ovaries and the thyroid and accept, take up, releasing hormones from the hypothalamus. Cat bed two is going to give up those releasing hormones and accept hormones from the anterior pituitary. Cat bed two does not affect posterior pituitary. Cat bed two is anterior pituitary gland. Once cat bed two releases, it picks up whatever's. It, yeah, it releases the releasing hormones from here and accepts the hormones from here. Accepts those and then transfers those. And then transfers to those back signal. to the heart to be distributed to the rest of the body. So those are those vessels. Remember, we have veins coming from cat bed two, and those veins are inferior hypophyseal.
gonads or gonads, but we'll put ovaries here. And then in between those, we have the anterior pituitary. of 
L-H-A, L-H, and F-H-A. High levels of L-H and F-H-H are going to increase progesterone. hypothalamus and to some extent the pituitary gland. Sometimes there's a direct effect. But if the estrogen levels are high, the GnRH levels will be low. If the estrogen levels are low, GnRH levels will be high. Okay. So let's say we have a 42-year-old woman who's in early menopause. She doesn't know that. She just knows that she hasn't had a, a period for 18 months, which was fine with her. Okay? She didn't care saved her some money, but she just got remarried, and her new husband wants his own kids. She had three of her own. She's done with childbearing, but she loves her new husband, and he wants kids, and they've been trying and can't get pregnant, so she's gone to visit her doctor. Well, just not having a period for 18 months doesn't necessarily mean that you're in menopause at the age of 42. It could be stress. Okay, it could be an active lifestyle where you're not getting enough fat in your diet and you're exercising too much. A lot of professional athletes who are women will go a year or more without a period. And so they start to do some tests. 